So I'm watching an episode of Police Story titled A Chance to Live, which is a fantastic episode by the way, and I couldn't help but notice that Michael Bean had an extremely brief and uncredited cameo in it. And it got me to thinking about how he's got to be one of the most underrated and underappreciated action stars back in the mid 80s through to the mid 90s. Michael Bean is one of those actors that I had over the years, picked out like a stock, thinking that he's going to blow up at any point and I wasn't too late to get in on it. Just think about some of the most notable movies that he's been in. The Terminator, Aliens, The Abyss, Tombstone, and The Rock. And I totally forgot about this, and it hit me recently, that in the early 90s as a teen, I actually went to go and see Navy Seals in 1990, Terminator 2 Judgment Day in 1991, Alien 3 in 1992, all in the movie theater, with the notion stuck in the back of my mind, that I was in large part wanting to actually see Michael Bean in those movies. Navy Seals was anything but successful. I don't remember anything about it other than seeing it, which is an extremely rare movie theater experience for me, to pay money to go and see it and it being that forgettable. That sort of leads into how the next few years would unfold for Michael Bean. Probably a very critical time for him to push through and build on his promising performances in The Terminator and in Aliens that were already several years old by this point in time, not including his being in the abyss, of course. I'm going to assume that it's the same for most people. When they think of The Terminator, they're going to think of Arnold Schwarzenegger first and probably Linda Hamilton second, which is completely understandable. But without my realizing it until recently, it's Kyle Reese's character and parts in the movie that I love the most. I saw Terminator 2 five times in the movie theater and once at the drive-in in the summer of 91. And if you'd asked me then, I likely thought it was the greatest movie since The Empire Strikes Back. After the sixth of viewing, I've never wanted to see it again. I was caught up in the hype. I also thought Guns N' Roses' You Could Be Mine was the best song ever. Again, once the hype died down in summer of 91, I no longer thought that. Now, I didn't know it then, but in years since, I could care less when T2 is on TV. That's not to say that it's a bad movie, and I know it's a good movie. But there's always a bit of resentment that I held for T2 in the years that followed, and I'm coming to realize that it's the absence of the Kyle Reese character that makes me not like it as much as I'd once thought I had. I know full well that Kyle Reese was killed off in the first film, but I'd seen a photo or two in various sci-fi magazines of his upcoming appearance in that movie leading up to its release in the summer of 91, that we never got to see. Though you can view those deleted scenes now, of course. And you can't imagine my level of disappointment after seeing Alien 3 the following year. And it's not a bad film, it's fine on its own. It's just not in the same class as Alien or Aliens. In fairness, not much out there is in that class, and Alien is one of my all-time favorite movies, and probably my favorite sci-fi film. Nevertheless, there was the idea that he was going to be in it, and they killed his character off right away. If you'd asked me the night I saw it, which just happened to be the movie's premiere date, Friday, May 22nd, 1992, leaving the theater, I thought it was okay, but the first thing that jumped out at me was that we didn't get to see any guns until the very end of the movie. I mean, there's a level of expectation after seeing Aliens, right? If Alien 3 was a follow-up to Alien, that expectation would be different, but Aliens is a sci-fi action flick, whereas Alien was a horror sci-fi film, and Alien 3 is more in line with the original Alien. But most importantly, I probably would have liked Alien 3 a lot more had Michael Bean been in the movie Guns or No Guns. Even if he dies at some point later on in the movie, just something with him in it. That's good enough. While we're here, you have two franchises with two of the strongest female leads in cinematic history, seriously, not forced on you, but done organically and done convincingly. And Michael Bean was there as a supporting guy in both instances. You'd think that he would have been a bigger deal by virtue of that. By the way, have you ever heard anyone complain that they like Alien, but it's unfortunate that the hero of the film was a woman? Me neither. Like anything, when it's done the right way, it's not an issue. One wonders if we were more ahead of the times 40 years ago. Moving forward a few years later with Tombstone, and you have a loaded lineup of stars, so Michael Bean is going to get lost in the mix, you'd think. But again, I have to remind myself that it's Michael Bean playing the role of Johnny Ringo. 
If I'm thinking about three or four of the most integral characters in Tombstone, I'm definitely placing Johnny Ringo within that group. For whatever reason, I'm fully cognizant that Kurt Russell is playing White Herb, Val Kilmer is playing Doc Holliday, Powers Booth is playing Curly Bill, Sam Elliott and Bill Paxton are playing Herb's brothers, heck, Jason Priestley sticks out like a sore thumb when I'm only thinking that it's Jason Priestley and not the character that he's playing. I was a big 90210 fan throughout the 90s, by the way, I'm just saying. And maybe that's the problem with Michael Bean. He makes a huge mark, but simultaneously he blends in too well. He reminds me of Jack Warden in The Verdict, or Sam Waterston in most things that he's been in. But they're dramatic supporting actors, and he's more of an action supporting actor, or at least he's generally been cast as one. If you break it down, he's got that action star look, his characters are at times low-key and somewhat mysterious, and believably so. He's also got that intensity, he's got that body that's lean and cut, and without exaggerated muscles. He fits a timeline that one can see him being cast as Luke Skywalker back in 77, but maybe there's something a little too dark about him. Perhaps he's more of an anti-hero, dark hero type, which again, you'd think that he'd be right there in the late 80s throughout the 90s, still young enough to play the Punisher or a character along those lines. Just going through his film and TV credits from the 1970s, there's another version of Michael Bean floating around. Most notably for me, his appearance is on James at 15, the pilot episode, Logan's Run, the TV series, Coach from 1978, Zuma Beach, the TV movie, Family, the episode titled The Athlete, and a breakthrough of sorts with his eventually being the lead in The Runaways TV show from 1978. Also of interest, I've noticed that he and Mark Wheeler have crossed paths in three things that would be in an episode of The Runaways titled 48 Hours to Live, the Police Story episode, A Chance to Live, that I'd mentioned at the beginning of the video, as well as Zuma Beach. Even with there being a 10 year gap in age, it makes me wonder if these two were friends at one time. I have to say that one of the most iconic shoes that I can think of in movies is Kyle Reese wearing Nike Vandals. The Terminator was released on October 26, 1984. That same night, Michael Jordan played his first NBA game. And with that, Jordan would sign his first Nike contract. And for those wondering, he didn't wear his classic Air Jordans until November or so of that year, but was wearing the white Nike airships initially. Jordan and the Bulls won their first title in 1991, and less than a month later, T2 Judgment Day was released on July 1st, actually opening up in Los Angeles theaters before the rest of the US. Oh yeah, the Bulls defeated the LA Lakers that year. Michael Bay, like Michael Jordan, was also born on February 17th. Michael Bay once called James Cameron an idol, and at one time passed on making Terminator 3. Bay would direct Bean and Ned Harris in The Rock in 1996, who both starred years earlier in James Cameron's The Abyss in 1989. The Rock was the fourth highest grossing film of 1996, while Michael Jordan's Space Jam was 10th. You do pronounce it Bean. It's Bean, yeah. Yeah, as in. I can't have beans beans. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In closing, Michael Bean quietly worked his way up the Hollywood food chain, made his mark, but as far as I'm concerned, never got the right vehicle as the main guy to take him to that next level. We only got glimpses of seeing him flex his dramatic ability. Never. In making this random thoughts video, I truly believe that Hollywood could have gotten so much more out of this guy. There's just one word that I can say. And that word says it all. Thanks.